And uh, to your methods, I mean, you, you have been traversing, you know, this country and the continent. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the United States of America, mm -hmm. I know that SMEs are also facing similar challenges because of coronavirus. How bad is it down there or up there? You know, I think that, um, I, I feel like Africa has actually gotten hit a lot harder than the SMEs in Africa. Uh, yes, there are people who are who have shut down and not reopened in the United States, but I can assure you it's nowhere near the devastation that I have witnessed on the African continent. Mm -hmm. And and so that has been disheartening, but I think we have uh, provided many solutions over the last 30 days for many African SMEs. We have impacted hundreds and hundreds of them, uh, and 63 of them financially, uh, in terms of making offers and so forth, uh, totaling $16.7 million in, in potential funding there. And there is additional funding uh, I've received no less than 100 additional proposals unsolicited from around the, 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 the continent, mm -hmm. uh, including from governments and some from some counties, and uh, how we can help them and help their SMEs and help empower uh, you know, the, the men and women, boys and girls in their communities. And it's everything. It's from education uh, initiatives, it's clean water initiatives, it's road infrastructure, uh, obviously utilities and stability with the technology, uh, and then, of course, all of the, the general SME sectors. When, when you scan, you know, of the, the, the SMEs, you know, that have come, you know, forward, you know, looking for funding opportunities, mm -hmm. uh, in a country whereby, you know, 3% of GDP, you know, comes from, you know, the SME sector, mm -hmm. which SME sector do you think is the hardest hit? Uh, the others. Yeah, well, hospitality, obviously, uh, as you mentioned in your preliminary remarks regarding hotels, hospitality, travel, uh, even, you know, the safari companies that we uh, that, that solicited funds, uh, some wanting uh, tour, you know, a lot of tour companies and hotels. But I will also say that uh, that there is a great opportunity as well for this. And I'm seeing some really uh, some strong resilience in African entrepreneurs and SMEs because they're starting to do digital safaris. They're starting to you know charge for these things where uh, and I think it's going to be a better, more sustainable model long term anyway, because they will be able to follow certain animals. People around the world will be fall in love with these these animals and the names and you know where are they today and how's their baby doing and you know things along those lines mm -hmm. and and they're able to charge for that monthly access so i think it's going to to really end up faring well for them but i will also say that the service sector uh really has been a hit and they're they're struggling with figuring out how to uh make other people feel comfortable so they can re-engage in business and a lot of it is uh, optics oh but i mean you know in your engagement with um you know, with various SMEs, you know, who are scouting for funding opportunities. Uh, what is this one striking thing that you came across? You know, there were a couple of very glaring uh, areas of opportunity that I think will help transform the Africa's economic land SME landscape. Compared to the rest of the world, there were two things. Number one, uh, traditional, generally speaking, they're, they're weak in branding, in global branding. And uh, obviously, as CEO of the hoverboard company, branding was critical to creating a, the best-selling product in the world. Um, and so I think that uh, the more we can strengthen African enterprises to get stronger on their branding, uh, it allows them to sell and export more. And that's new. The exportation market is, is new, really, uh, for, for Africa. So, so used to import. They export the raw material and import the finished good. And of course, now we're trying to help African enterprises you know, uh, take the raw material that is, that is here and then grow it, develop it, uh, brand it, package it, export it. And I think that will help the, the economy. So branding was the first. And then the second thing was there was a big disparity between where they wanted to be and how much uh, where they needed to start. So for example, in the United States uh, and in most countries that are developed entrepreneurially, we all understand where you have to start, mm -hmm. um, but many of the requests and proposals that came in, they were pitching as if we build, I can't even tell you how, they, how many of them wanted us to build factories and plants and things like that. And these are people who have never built a one bedroom house, much less you know plants and factories. They just don't know what all is entailed in that. We wouldn't give that kind of uh, money and, and, and responsibility to anyone in the United States that didn't have decades of experience behind them and have done it uh, and have teams that have done it behind them. Uh, and even then, it, it would take years to convince someone to invest in that. So the expectation gap 
was uh, really interesting. And so, but it also allowed us to, to really educate them and say, look, this money would actually hurt you. If I give you what you're asking for right now, mm -hmm. I will destroy you and you don't even know it. So I'm going to save you from yourself. I'm going to protect you from yourself and I'm going to help you start here. And then once you get, take this money and get here, then I'm going to give you w more money so that you can get there. And you have to grow uh, in those stages. Uh, that's why there's a thing called seed capital and series A and B and C. I mean, because you only take money as you need it and as you grow. Mm -hmm. And so that was a great thing. I'm also excited about revenue sharing opportunities with, with, uh, with African enterprises because that puts us both in the same boat. Instead of loans where, where you've got to pay regardless of, uh, well, you have to pay regardless of, uh, of, of how well your business is doing or how much cash flow is coming in, revenue sharing is where uh, it's a certain percentage of your revenue uh, and that's what gets paid towards the, 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 the money borrowed, mm -hmm. which means when your sales are down, your payment is equal to that. When it's high, it's equal to that. So it never puts undue hardship on the enterprise. Mm -hmm. Look, I mean, you see, the, the challenge is, you know, that uh, the SMEs in Kenya are facing may not be necessarily be different from what's happening in the U.S. I mean, whereby, you know, millions of people have lost their jobs. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, funding to this sector, you know, has dried up. And I was going through, uh, you know, data from uh, the, the, the trade representative in the U.S. And they were saying that almost 40% of SMEs, you know, are facing challenges, you know, in accessing funding in the U.S. And so one may want to find out, I mean, you have investors in the U.S. who are willing to come and, 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 and lend or fund African SMEs. Why are they appetite here while they still have appetite back at home? It's a fantastic question, and I think the difference is, uh, in some respects, mindset. So I, my position is that many of the enterprises in the U.S. are using COVID as an excuse. And so the, they're wanting funding in, in the role of uh, more handouts or grants because that's what's available in the United States right now. Uh, so to take on a lot of debt capital uh, is, is, is not advisable at this time for most U.S. enterprises. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, most U.S. investors do not have an appetite for investing at all right now either. Uh, especially in many of the sectors that uh, we were presented on. Mm -hmm. The difference was we weren't just investing in ideas and in projects, we were investing in people. And when there were, these were valuable enterprises that have good businesses, even during and through COVID, they are adapting and that kind of, their ability to pivot is where the, the comfort and the collateral really comes from. Mm -hmm. so, so the difference was um, mindset, mentality, uh, track record, and uh, there is some element of diversification there that is valuable as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, what lessons do you think, uh, you know, African countries, you know, can learn from, you see, your government instituted a stimulus package, you know, to help struggling SMEs, you know, about 250 billion U.S. dollars, mm -hmm. you, you know, in form of grants. Mm -hmm. Well, the jury is still out there on what has been the impact of all these because it is still too early. Tell me these, uh, when you do a scan of what has actually happened with, the, with these kind of grants to SMEs, do you think this is something that can be replicated, you know, in a country like ours? Uh, I think, I don't think it can be replicated in a country, uh, in most countries in the, around the world. Uh, we've passed the largest stimulus package in U.S. history, several trillion dollars, and we're looking at additional ones right now. Um, it has, it has helped. There's no doubt it's helped. Uh, but it's kind of like anybody who has saved up, or it's not because America's been saving, but anybody who has a large reservoir of, of, of cash supply uh, can, uh, you know, when they are hit, they can last longer. They can stay propped up longer. Uh, just like in a personal family that's been hit by COVID, the more resources they had, the longer they can endure this. And then someone who doesn't have very many resources, like she said, the very next day, mm -hmm. there's no food on the table. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the, I, I look at the United States government, you know, in a very similar light that uh, mm -hmm. we had, uh, you know, deeper uh, reserves or, or deeper ability to print money um, to, to, to navigate this. I also think there will be a lot of uh, financial movement around the world, and I think Kenya will be a part of that in terms of uh, with nations and China and settling uh, based on the number of coronavirus cases, deaths, and so forth. 
I think all of those numbers, I think that's why there's so much uh, sketchiness in the numbers that we hear from all of the uh, major health organizations around the world because there is a financial, a direct financial tie to the number of cases. So there is a, there's a financial incentive for, there to, for the cases to keep increasing day by day. We have seen, you know, you know, countries, you know, like the UK, you know, saying that we are not going to give you funding, but what we can do is for you to remain afloat and to ensure that you do not close your business, we're going to give you money to pay your employees so that you don't end up closing business. Do you also think this is this is some sort of a kind of a model that can be replicated here? I do, and, I, and, and we, we called that the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program. Mm. I think that's actually more valuable than, all, than even the grants to the businesses. And now granted, you gotta have both, but even if a business is completely shut down, at least bypassing an owner and an entrepreneur who did take all the risk, who, they also make all the gains. Um, that's also why uh, I don't like the income equality conversation as it relates to positions in companies because this is entrepreneur risked everything and we want to shame him when he's making millions and his employees are making 50,000 uh, but they don't understand that in times like this he loses everything he loses his house the employees do not right so what you, you based on jobs. the amount of risk you get exactly based on the amount of risk you're taking uh, determines the amount of reward you get it's an equal ratio really so um, uh, but in terms of the Paycheck Protection Program, what I love about it is it does flow directly to the people who really need it most. The people who, this is a matter, not a matter of, you know, what happens to my retirement. It's people who, how do I feed my children tomorrow or this afternoon? And that kind of immediate pass through, because there are many ways to prevent scandal with that, which I like, uh, in terms of your, your, your submitting, SMEs have to submit, you know, six months of payroll, the uh, previous payroll, so we know how much they were making. We know how many hours they were working. And so to be able to backstop that is very effective, and it at least minimizes the long-term damage, uh, you know, in that case. Look at the, some of the stats unrelated to this, but affect SMEs. When the school shut down here, uh, we had a, a, a school uh, here trying to promote and pitch uh, funds to me for uh, the 10% of their girls ages 12 through 15 have gotten pregnant during the COVID lockdown. That is a real problem. 10%. 10%. 10%, no, 10% even mm -hmm. worse. 10% of every girls in that school have gotten pregnant uh, between that, uh, that, at that young age because of the lockdown. And that's what I mean with the Paycheck Protection Program. It's going to at least stabilize some of that family structure, home structure, so that uh, it, as, as Madam Nakon mentioned, minimizes crime, minimizes violence, minimizes rape, minimizes teen pregnancy, mm. min which all hurt women's health, mm. hurts women's ability to start and grow businesses, mm. and, uh, and certainly affects uh, you know, the entire continent in such a profound way. So we're, we're just glad to be a part of it. At Transform Africa, we have a lot of initiatives to, to um, you know, that, that, that answer this directly, and uh, we are implementing those measures uh, uh, imminently. Is it, isn't it too risky for any investor now to invest in a highly uncertain market like the one that we are going through now? Yeah, you know, and, and I appreciate the question because it, it ties into what I think is that, yes, it's nice when government can help SMEs, but listen, if you're a real entrepreneur, if you're relying on the government to keep you afloat, then you're, you've got the wrong idea anyway, and you probably shouldn't even be in business. Mm -hmm. uh, the real entrepreneurs uh, are not waiting for the government to bail them out. No, they did not ask for this situation. No, it's not fair. No, it's not right. But... It's the situation we are in, so what are you going to do about it? And it is your job to uh, innovate and to get more creative and to pivot. Um, I can tell you that I don't even like the idea, overly like the idea of government propping up a bunch of SMEs because I think there has been so much inefficiency <laughs> in SMEs. So why would I pay for your dysfunction? You know, this is a chance to clean up your act and to start doing it right. Things that you could have never done before, you can do right now. And so I think there's a lot of responsibility, and that is the word, accountability and responsibility, on the SME and the entrepreneurs 
for their future. I love one of the entrepreneurs that met with me a couple weeks ago who that used to have a shoe shop. You know, the things on the side of the road where it's just a maybe a little hut or you just put a blanket down and you put your shoes. Mm -hmm. They were selling shoes for years. They've sold shoes in this one spot. And obviously with COVID, uh, a lot of people here stopped buying the shoes because they, they weren't walking to work. And so uh, now what they've done is they were telling me how they're into cabbage and into vegetables and into different things. And they needed... Uh, uh, just a small amount of funding so that they could buy inventory. Now, at the same time, I said, I don't want you to buy this inventory. Go sell all of this and then use it to pay personal living expenses because then you have no money to rebuy inventory a second time. So a lot of this is about education and not protecting them from themselves, not letting them hurt themselves as they succeed. Uh, and so I, th and I think we have a good model for helping these uh, SMEs and entrepreneurs get in business, but then make sure that they can't use all of their profit mm -hmm. uh, for living expenses so that we have enough money to buy more inventory mm -hmm. and keep them going. Yeah. You know, Dr. Roland Robas is the CEO of Courageous. Definitely for now, I mean, he's not the most popular guy among the SMEs. He does not advocate for state funding or state bailing out, you know, struggling SMEs, he says, mm. they should deal with their problems. What do you think about this? We're having a great discussion mm. here. If we had waited for the government, we'd still be waiting, and we would have Absolutely. hurt hundreds of enterprises. Uh, yeah. We would have been adding to the problem. Absolutely. And that's what I think when people stop yeah. contributing yeah. because of what was done to them, then they're, they're just perpetuating the problem. Yeah. And, and, you know, part of this, O'Brien, mm. is I just see people as victors, not victims. So mm. the entrepreneurs who, who kind of have the reliance over an over over-reliance on government, it's great when they can help out. Mm -hmm. I, I, do, I do like that. But, uh, but an over-reliance on government support um, mm -hmm. is where I question how they view themselves and the tenacity mm -hmm. that they have. I, it starts to make me wonder, where, what validates you? Where do you receive your self-worth, your validation that you're, what you're doing is right, mm -hmm. that you're doing the right business? And, uh, and so I like to see those who, who continue forward mm -hmm. in spite of the odds, uh, because I know that they, that's why I appreciated every entrepreneur who stood before me, just vulnerable, transparent. Mm -hmm. Here's my heart. Here's my business. Here's my dream. Here's how much revenue we're doing or not doing mm -hmm. because of COVID. And, um, and here's how much money we need. And here's what I need it for. And that showed me that they were, they saw themselves as victors, not as victims. Mm -hmm. And that even though they can't control this, they're going to still take every possible measure they mm -hmm. can for themselves and their family. They did not give up. Absolutely. Tell me this. I mean, uh, uh, you know, mm. both of you, I mean, you sound like you're highly, you know, against, uh, you know, the government bailouts, you know, to the private sector. And this is a culture, you it's know. It's because we always pay for it later. And well, that's of course why. we have to. Yeah, yeah, right. So, yeah. so if it was just a bailout, mm -hmm. that would be nice. I mean, hey, I'll take free money all day long. I'll give you my account numbers. Anybody can feel free to wire another hundred million to it. That'd be great. The problem is the, the pain that I'm going to feel later on. Do you... Are you willing to accept temporary convenience for permanent pain? And not just for yourself, but for your kids and grandkids, because this financing scheme is going to be hurting people for decades and generations. What lessons have you learned through your interaction with SMEs? And what do you think is the way forward? Well, I think the way forward is, and I think your uh, African enterprises are poised for this, uh, I would like to see them leapfrog uh, where even the United States is because we've become so complacent in many regards uh, with entrepreneurship and with business. It's so routine and so common that it's not new and exciting and uh, as adventurous. And, and, and so I, uh, you know, African entrepreneurs started here and American entrepreneurs and many of those others around the world were here. What we have done with the African funding tours and through the six month process was bring the African enterprises up to where they had a global standard of excellence so that we could fund them and but I don't want to just bring them up to this standard I want them to be better I want them to grow go past and you can always get ahead when other people are slowing down so if you work a nine to five job most people take the evenings off and weekends off but that's your time to get ahead same thing as a business owner in an SME during this time when everyone else slowed down you could be thinking how do I get ahead how do I go past uh, because the fundamental reset button has been hit in business. And let me tell you, that is the biggest dream an entrepreneur could ever hope for because the only way the little guy, the SME, the Steve Jobs in his garage, the Bill Gates in his room, the, the Jeff Bezos in a very small, tiny room that built an Amazon, a Jack Ma who built an Alibaba, the, every single one of them started 
uh, so insanely small, but they beat, as an SME, but they beat the biggest corporations in the world, many of which are out of business today, because they changed the rules of the game. And what COVID has done is changed, it has leveled the playing field, it hit the reset button, there are no rules for many industries of what the industry should look like going forward. Everyone's trying to fill it out, which means the SMEs, this is your time to change the rules of the game and establish what the rules should be going forward for your industry. Changing the rules of the game, that is the way forward.